Urban populations are growing rapidly. They need homes, jobs and infrastructure. But some cities struggle to provide these because they are running out of land. We do have an increasing population. The increase of land is a must. It's a must. Singapore needs an additional 5,600 hectares of land by 2030 to cater for more people. Local business enterprises and global companies essential to building a thriving economy all require land for their operations. If we stop attracting such investment in Singapore because of our constraint and we don't find an answer to it, it will definitely you know, have an impact on our national strategy. The small country is sparing no effort in finding new ways to overcome its land constraint. We need to just pick up every stone, explore and seize those opportunities. But the sky is the limit. Many cities are next to the sea. Rivers run through urban centers. As land becomes scarce, water surfaces could be where we build in the future. I see tremendous opportunity if we allow our imagination to go unhindered. In Britain, architects have floated the idea of having the Houses of Parliament on the River Thames in London. Politicians could work from here when it's time to refurbish the historic building on land. And in Singapore, engineers would like to build a desalination plant on water. These facilities remove salt from seawater to make it drinkable. They take up large areas when constructed on land. Siting them on water would free up space for other uses on the land-scarce island. We are just using every possible surface and expanding our options. We have to examine every single option that's available. We need to just pick up every stone and seize those opportunities. Singapore's territorial waters are spread over 700 square kilometres. Companies confronted by limited land in the small country are turning to the sea. But space here is equally scarce. Singapore is one of the busiest ports in the world. Over 1,000 ships ply its waters each day. That they actually find a bird, but they allow a certain radius for it to rotate. And that takes up a lot of uh, sea space. Researchers are searching for a more efficient way to berth ships. They can actually construct guided platforms where actually ships can just park almost like a car, try to optimize the use of a uh, sea space, and that offers us more opportunities to use it. Data centre companies would be among the first to take up available spots. They can use seawater to cool equipment and solar panels to generate energy for powering the facility. Water is good because it's a much more efficient medium for carrying heat. So that allows us to deploy even higher density racks per rack per square foot. This potentially makes a seaborne data center more suitable for high performance computing than one based on land. Floating in the sea also has another advantage. We are going after the idea of zero water usage consumption. Such environment friendly business practices would give industry players the green credentials more clients are looking for. 
and they're expecting their suppliers, including those in the data center world, to be able to support their move towards 100% renewable energy and sustainability. Singapore is a major international data center hub. But being short of land has raised questions about its future in this booming industry. There are concerns. It's an issue for a market such as Singapore to make sure that land remains available for data center players because they do have a lot of choices about where they can go. If we stop attracting such investment in Singapore because of our constraint and we don't find an answer to it, it will definitely you know, have an impact on our national strategy. Singapore aims to be one of the world's leading digital economies. A thriving data center industry is essential if it's to reach this goal. To grow this industry, building out at sea could be one of the solutions. It could even lead to new business opportunities if companies could successfully build and operate sea-based data centers. We have a lot of inquiries from coastal cities. Typically, most coastal cities are very busy cities and their land prices are very expensive and they're out of land too. So we believe there is an opportunity there, definitely. And to overcome its limited land, Singapore could use the sea around its shores to build more than just data centers. The Green Float is a city on the sea for up to 50,000 people. Homes will be at the top, offices in the middle section, vegetable farms at the bottom. Around it will be beaches. The Green Float is the brainchild of Japanese construction company, Shimitsu Corporation. Its team is sure the sea around Singapore is suitable for the floating city. Poring over maps of the island, they discuss a few potential locations. The calm equatorial waters here are probably one of the best and safest places in the world to build the green float. シンガポールでは波も少なく風も少ないので、より安全です。で、一方でエネルギーグリーンの方で言うと、ソーラー発電のようなものはシンガポールは非常に向いてます。The Green Float is more than just a concept on paper. Shimizu Corporation believes it can actually be built. でも実際そのグリーンフロートの、え、コンセプト、技術的な面、いろんなことを自分も学んだりする中で、これは、あの、自分の孫の代じゃなくて、あの、生きてる間に実現できるぞと。It would take about 10 years to construct one green float with a 3 km base and a 1 km high tower. Once completed, it is expected to last 100 years. At the Shimizu Institute of Technology, scientists have achieved breakthroughs in creating concrete suitable for building structures on the sea. This brings the possibility of constructing the green float one step closer to reality. They have also erected an experimental structure, half floating on water.
researchers have been keeping watch on it for the past years. What they learn could be applied to building the green float. So, they are coy about revealing the bill for this. But it is known land reclamation over 20 meters requires digging deep into the pocket. The team is working towards the day when the sea view from his hotel room will have a green float on it. Landscare cities are building in the air. Should Singapore do the same? Wherever you are in the world, you're having to become more inventive in terms of where you can build, and it's not always the usual sites that you might think of. Making better use of land is a challenge facing many cities. Architects and developers are responding with imaginative solutions, such as by stacking new structures on top of existing buildings. This new concert hall was designed to sit above a brick warehouse built in the 1960s. An efficient way of creating a cultural venue without straining the land supply. It opened in 2017 and has become a landmark in the port city of Hamburg in Germany. London is taking this idea of adding new stories on roofs even further. The city has a housing crisis. It needs 66,000 new homes a year for the increasing number of people who want to live there. But there isn't enough land to construct them. Baker Street, a prime area in London. There is no space left on the ground to build on. But that's not a problem for Mr. Arshad Bhatti. As you can see, just opposite us, these buildings are capable of taking extra stories. And if we can build seven new homes in the heart of Baker Street, we're talking about multi-million pounds for each apartment. That is just the tip of the iceberg. Research by Mr. Barty's company found it is possible to have 180,000 new homes in London by adding one story above suitable buildings. Developers must secure rights to the airspace above a building before they can place a structure, such as this penthouse, on it. The penthouse's seven modules are made of light steel gauge. These are manufactured in factories at another location, then transported to the site. It will be fully assembled in a day, without major disturbances to residents. We have new technologies to enhance the structural integrity of these buildings, which not only will build new units which are safe to live, but also enhance the integrity of the existing buildings. Because they're being built in the factory environment, they are more precision made, they're of better quality, they come with warranties.
Mr. Barty is one of the first in London to specialise in rooftop property development. His company expects to build about 100 such homes in London in 2019, including some in middle and lower income areas. He has come a long way since his difficult entry into this business. Well, it all started here with this building. When I came to see this building first time, it was a three-story building. So I had this idea that potentially if I buy this building, I can put a story on top. And that's where it all started from. It was an unusual concept at the time. Banks brushed him off when he tried to secure a loan. But he persevered and turned his idea into reality. Well, it was a very easy sell in the end. There were two people who were bidding for it, and the eventual winner ended up paying £172,000 more than the asking price, and the flat was sold for £1.272 million. We were able to show it that these spaces can be used for a valuable purpose. You can build new homes, and you can build hundreds and thousands of new homes. In this city with a pressing need to increase its housing supply, Mr. Barty has found a way to meet the demand. It's not surprising that these are more than just rooftops to him. There's 732 acres of land. That is what the roofs are across London. We are bringing a new land supply into equation. Other cities in the United Kingdom have spoken to Mr. Barty about building similar structures there. He's also had inquiries from New Zealand and Abu Dhabi. We will make it a global reality. You will see airspace developments being built in the factories, put on top of the buildings across the world. Could this idea of building new structures on existing ones work in Singapore too? A study had proposed adding new levels above low-rise shop houses, similar to what Mr. Ashad Bhatti is doing in London. The suggestion we gave is built on top of these conserved houses. Technology is available. If you build on it, there shouldn't be a problem. Our land is so precious. So it doesn't make sense to have a three to four story structure. While it is technically possible to build over shop houses, and the Landscare City State needs all the space it can get, any decision to do so has to be weighed against other priorities, such as leaving low rise heritage areas as they are. Whether we build above existing structures, it's a matter of policy. Of course, it's societal acceptance of it. The next idea for overcoming land shortage in Singapore is most surprising. Michael Shaw and his son Cameron develop rooftop homes in London. Cameron Shaw worked in Singapore for a few years. His father visited often and spotted an opportunity during his trips. What you actually have is land potential that is being underused. In a small country where land is at such a premium, it's really wasted land resource. Mr. Shaw wants to build apartments above drainage canals. It's only when they have heavy rainfall that they come into their own. But the rest of the time, they are basically land space that is unused. He plans to lay a frame over the canal. This forms the support structure for apartments. The modular components will be made in a factory at another location, then brought here for assembly. Each development would be six storeys high, with a total of 60 apartments in various sizes, from one to three bedrooms. You're not having to buy the land. 
and that is a huge saving. So even if the actual construction method is slightly more expensive, the overall savings will be huge. It's something that we could build tomorrow. Besides housing, transport infrastructure takes up lots of space in a city. Architects have a challenge on their hands, finding ways of making better use of the space around these structures. I think there's always opportunities to create new space in and above existing infrastructure, whether that's railway lines or roads or stations. One of his firm's signature projects is Embankment Place. Buildings put on a roof constructed over Charing Cross, one of the biggest, busiest railway stations in London. We built a million square feet of office space suspended above it, and the trains didn't stop once. It's a, a piece of London that was never thought to be possible. The empty space above expressways could be just as productive. A major expressway running through the city of Hamburg in Germany is getting a cover built over it. The new land created is turned into parks and used for other facilities. It also connects communities previously separated by the expressway. This idea of building over major roads and expressways could be relevant in Singapore. There were suggestions to construct a bridge-like structure over an expressway on the island. This would serve as an area on which low-rise offices or community facilities could stand. It might be a way to inject new spaces into business and commercial areas in the future. From seeing rooftops as land to build on, to constructing over canals and expressways, new ideas to overcome land scarcity emerge by freeing the imagination to see familiar things from new perspectives. How can we look for new opportunities to build under and over and above in a more creative way? There's always space to find. As countries compete for global companies to invest and set up operations on their soil, Singapore's lack of land may put it at a disadvantage. We make no bones about it. We tell them that Singapore is small, land will be priced accordingly. In a landscape city-state, its valuable and limited land resource has to be shared among the nation's many needs. From housing to recreation, from industry to transport. As a small country, you have to be very judicious in how you use land. We are always going to have to make very difficult trade-offs. Land for housing, should that be expanded in place of industry? Land use plays an important role in economic development. A fixed area is entrusted to government agencies, tasked with steering Singapore towards sustainable growth. When we make decisions in terms of how much land to give, what sort of investments we bring in, we make it in light of what opportunities are we creating for Singaporeans, what capabilities are we anchoring here so that our children can have better jobs and much more opportunities in the future. Very often, the economic agencies work very closely with us to innovate such that we can bring in these uh, economic activities but optimise land. Jurong Island would be a good example of that. In the 1980s, Singapore set about growing the petrochemical industry to diversify its economy. It needed land to achieve this strategic goal. 
the government took a bold decision to join seven islands into one, the 3,000 hectare Jurong Island. Today, 100 global chemical firms are here, bringing over 50 billion Singapore dollars worth of investments and employing around 15,000 people. After it built Jurong Island, JTC Corporation dug deep under it. About 40 stories below the seabed lies rock caverns and kilometers of tunnels. These have a capacity for storing 1.47 million cubic meters of liquid hydrocarbons. By using the underground for this, around 60 hectares of surface land is released for higher value activities, such as petrochemical manufacturing. You build underground, you unlock previously unavailable land. So it's no longer about land, but really it's about space. The sky is the limit, and underground is also the limit. Besides creating new land and using the underground, a fresh supply of land becomes available when facilities vacate their premises. In 2013, it was announced that the Pyalaba Air Base would move to Changi. By relocating Pyalaba Air Base, we are able to free up 800 hectares of land and put it to new development for new jobs and housing. We are always trying to make use of land and recycle land for new users to make sure that we have enough space in the future for sustainable growth. In the past, Singapore's lack of land made it unsuitable for industries that require large tracts of it. Today, technology minimizes this disadvantage. In the 1970s, 9% of its population, about 175,000 people, was involved in agriculture. Without enough land at an affordable price, this industry did not thrive in the land-scarce country. Land is still expensive, but it has become economically viable because you can actually increase yields, you have technology, you can stack farms up. In vertical farming, vegetables are grown in towering racks. These need less land than farms on the ground. At the same time, computer-optimized lighting and innovative cultivation methods bring in much better harvests. With AI, with big data, with sensors, we are beginning to see the resurgence of agriculture. Previously unviable industries are becoming viable in Singapore. This high-tech, high-rise agriculture is bringing new opportunities. I was at an agriculture conference held in Singapore, and it's really unthinkable to have an agriculture conference in Singapore in the 20th century. But today, in the 21st century, it has the potential to contribute to economic growth. Singapore is gaining recognition for urban farming solutions. Companies here are expanding to cities in Asia, hungry for expertise in vertical farms to feed their rapidly growing urban population. Countries with ample land are able to offer hectares of it to investors and at much cheaper rates than Singapore could ever put on the table. But its lack of this resource has not kept companies away. 25 global logistic firms have chosen to set up in Singapore. Even though this industry requires a lot of land for warehouses. With technology, their operations still run efficiently, despite working out of less space than they are used to. Automation is a driver for both the productivity and the space. We are able to pick the goods and prepare the goods for shipping out much faster. We actually require lesser storage space as compared to a traditional warehouse. 
For storing products, the space between racks is just wide enough for a machine to glide through, and not a centimeter more. To maximize space even further, shelving rises up to 16 meters. Automation plus space optimization achieve about 30% additional storage capacity within the same area. We also design all our process around the space saving because this constraint must be kept in mind all the time. Multi-storey warehouses are what distinguish a logistic operation in Singapore compared to places with the luxury of land. There is a ramp up for the trucks to go up. This is something that doesn't even exist in Europe. Because Europe is mostly building a flat warehouse without stories, they don't need the ramp. I think Singapore is a pioneer in terms of how to optimize the space. But the shortage and high cost of land continue to be undeniable challenges in attracting companies here. We make no bones about it. We, we tell them that Singapore is small, land will be priced accordingly. Land is one among many items on a company's long checklist when it comes to selecting locations to invest in. Other factors come into play. They're looking for talent, they're looking for stability, they're looking for connections to markets, they're looking for a very efficient distribution system, and all that Singapore has advantages in. We have the ports, we have the airports, and we have also the land transportation from Malaysia. In a European environment, all those uh, activities are scattered around different cities. So the lead time to consolidate all the cargo will take much longer. But here in Singapore, within 50 kilometers, we can do all the activities. The logistic industry is growing rapidly and more warehouses will have to be built. Land is limited in Singapore. What will happen then? Well, the only option I can see is building underground. The idea of underground logistic warehouses is not far-fetched. In Hong Kong, there are plans to locate them inside large caves or caverns. Storage areas will be linked by tunnels, where trucks can drive through. Nowadays, logistics is one of the big business in every modern city. Where can we find the land? We want to develop Hong Kong as a digital city, then we need data center. So where the land can come from? It could come from blasting caverns into hills surrounding the city. This is one of the ways land scarce Hong Kong is creating much needed space for public and private sector use. The Cavern development is actually one of the long-term measures that can help to increase the land supply in Hong Kong. Under that planned 48 strategic Cavern areas contribute to about 1,200 to 1,800 hectares of land. Hong Kong's innovative Cavern Master Plan has won international recognition. Efforts are also being made to reach out to the public. The outside of the hillside is quite undisturbed, but inside it could be a huge data center. So we built up a model such that people can visualize what is the possibility on that. Most people have not been inside caverns. It may take time to warm to the idea of using spaces inside hills, although it is safe to do so. Caverns can work as business locations. These could be the new premises some companies in Hong Kong are searching for. There's quite a bit of interest in the private sector. We've had discussions, I said, okay, how can we facilitate this? And the government's been thinking about that as well. Hopefully that will spearhead some of the private sector to take that up. Changes sweeping across the world will impact land use in cities, including Singapore. With autonomous vehicles going mainstream, we can get 30% of the current road space back. 
think it's something that people don't recognise that will be a game changer. Hong Kong is as short of land as Singapore. It aspires to be Asia's world city, a livable, economically vibrant and sustainable place. More land is essential if it is to reach this goal. We are actually running out of grey A office buildings. If we are talking about another central business district, we need land. Where can we find it? If we are talking about livability, we may need a little bit more open space, so we need land. Up to 2043, we are estimated to have a population of about 8.22. It's about a million from now. So the increase of land is a must. It's a must. The Cavern Master Plan is one of the ways to gradually boost land supply over a period of time. Space will be created by excavating large caves or caverns inside hills. The city is expanded up to the fringe of the existing sort of hillsides, and Hong Kong is quite unique in that we have the opportunity to continue into the hillsides. The hills are made of strong rock, suited to cavern development. There are already a few of these in use. The entrance to the Stanley Sewage Treatment Works is discreetly tucked into a hill. It opened in 1995 and operates out of three large caverns. Work goes on without disturbing the public with offending odours and views of unsightly equipment. Caverns are ideal for such infrastructure. People prefer not to live, work or play near these necessary but unpleasant facilities. Residents near the Shut and Sewage Treatment Works won't miss its distinctive smell after it moves into the hill across from where it is now. This hill is one of the 48 strategic areas identified in the Cavern Master Plan. With this relocation, the 28 hectares of valuable prime waterfront land the facility now occupies will be released for other purposes, such as housing. More opportunities to use cavern spaces will arise when planning to build new areas, such as towns or business districts. If we develop the new area, when there is uh, some strategic cavern area nearby. So why not we can bundle them together to have an integrated approach, and then we can have more resources to meet the long-term development need. Similar to Hong Kong, taking a long-term view is one of the pillars of Singapore's approach to land use planning. It has been so since becoming a sovereign country in 1965. In 1967, the government turned to the United Nations for assistance to prepare a land use plan for the city-state. It was ready four years later. It was a very important plan. It was our first long-term strategic plan that set out the land that we needed to safeguard for development for the next 40 to 50 years. Much of what we see in Singapore today is the realization of this plan over the past four decades. Keeping the central area of Singapore for nature reserves and water catchment, placing residential towns around it, and citing heavy industries in the West all came out of that plan. Way back then, experts on the United Nations team had envisioned the need for a network of train lines and even mapped out locations of train stations to serve people living in public housing estates. It anticipated Singapore would eventually need more land to grow its central business district and suggested reclamation south of the CBD. Mm -hmm. 
30 years later, buildings on Marina Bay stand on the result of that recommendation. A testament to the foresight and long-term nature of the plan. Having an area to expand the business district meant Boat Quay and Chinatown could remain. Strategic, long-term planning made it possible to conserve these historic areas. Perhaps the most valuable legacy from the United Nations team is the way it brought different government agencies together to come up with a common land use blueprint. This process continues till today. The fact that we have limited land is one of the driving forces in why we plan long-term and in an integrated fashion. We need to make sure that land users are put in the right places so that we can optimise all the different uses together. We cannot afford not to work closely together. Salita Aerospace Park is a classic example of that, which is managed by JDC, but we work very closely with JDC to bring in good aerospace MRO companies into Singapore. And you can see the intersections of JDC and URA, because increasingly, you want to create beautiful work environments for the workers. This ability to plan in an integrated, holistic and long-term manner is more important than ever. Now that Singapore wants to become an innovation-driven economy. How we use land and how we integrate it with working, living or playing is going to be increasingly important. It is no longer viable to say, OK, this is land for economy, this is land for play, this is land for living in. It needs to be enmeshed together because that's where new innovation can arise. That's the kind of land planning we need. Today, Singapore's latest land use plan looks like this. Every plot on this tiny island of 720 square kilometers is designated for a particular use. Even those vacant pieces of land will eventually serve a purpose. For those who look around and see empty land, we say, look at the master plan, and we can see the long-term planning intentions for it. We want to make sure that future generations of Singaporeans still have space to grow, still have space to develop new buildings to meet future needs. A more immediate task is finding ways for spaces to serve double duty, especially those that are underutilised at certain times. Roads are built for vehicles. But if that's all they are used for, cities are missing out on the full potential of the 12% surface area they occupy. We need to be able to think creatively about how we can use roads in a more multifunctional way. Some roads have varying levels of usage at different times of the day or days of the week. Consider traffic in the central business district. Very busy during weekdays, almost non-existent on weekends. If public buses could be diverted on, say, Sundays, roads could be available for other uses. That road could be used for a pop-up cinema, for yoga, for tai chi. There's a much more intelligent programming of roads that can mean roads can become public space. In the coming years, the road infrastructure of today will evolve into something different. With autonomous vehicles going mainstream, we can get something like 30% of the current road space back and 80% of the car parks. So I think it's something that people don't recognize that will be a game changer. That's something we're watching very closely with LTA. Very likely, we will see in the future automated vehicles for fleets, for example, public buses and so on. This will change the way that the roads are used. Right now, because the future is not so clear, we are keeping an open mind and trying to see how we can plan ahead that will cater to these different uh, scenarios. New technology will impact land use, 
Cities across the world must have an adequate response to this. The plan should always be dynamic because situation changes. We may have a plan for what we can see now. 20 years down, it can be a totally different plan. Singapore has in place a collaborative and thorough land use planning process. It is a strong foundation from which the country is able to forge ahead, even as it encounters uncertain winds of change. We don't know the future, but we make provision. In the meantime, the small city-state will leave no stone unturned as it seeks out land and space for the continued well-being of its people.